Hey everyone, welcome to uh, this live expert panel on the state of sales development in 2020, brought to you by SD Revolution. Uh, my name is AJ Alonzo, and I'm joined with me, uh, it's Grayson Fulbright for this event. Uh, we're both the co-founders of SD Rev, and we're co-moderating this event. So, uh, Grayson, go ahead, say hey to everyone. Hey guys, Grayson here from SD Rev. Uh, we're really excited to be hosting this panel. Uh, we really want to help teams navigate this this post-COVID landscape and. Our panelists will be touching on uh, really the impact of today's climate on sales teams. And then more importantly, what we wanna answer is, is what advice and how should people be moving forward so that they can prepare for the future and not only survive, but, but thrive in those climates. We've got some awesome panelists here today, but before we introduce them, just wanted to run through some housekeeping real quick. Um, obviously this is a live event. You're all here if you're here live, thank you. Uh, but we are recording it, so if you can't stay for the full hour or if you're planning on watching this at a different time at some point in the future, we've got you covered. Uh, we're also taking questions from the audience throughout the event. So if something pops up during the discussion, uh, feel free to chat in to, I believe the uh, name is just SD Revolution. If you have a question, um, go ahead and chat them directly and we'll see if we have time uh, at the end during the Q&A session to get it answered for you. Cool. So um, to get us kicked off, I wanted to go around and, and kind of give all of these awesome, awesome panelists the, the chance to introduce themselves and kind of give some context to the audience. So, you know, first I want to introduce Morgan J. Ingram. He is the director of sales execution and evolution at Jay Barrows. Uh, and not only is he a LinkedIn top sales voice two years in a row, 2018 and 2019, he's a really powerful change, change agent for SDR teams. So Morgan, you know, thank you for joining us. And if you could take a minute and tell us a little bit more, you know, about your role and what vantage point you think you're going to be bringing to the panel today. Yeah. So what I do as of today is just director of sales execution evolution. So I'm still prospecting on a day-to-day -day basis to show, Hey, what is working and what is not as I'm training clients from a global perspective. And so what I'm bringing today is talking about what is working in terms of prospecting, what not to do, things to think about as we continuously move in the sales development and prospecting functions. That's awesome to hear. Cool. Well, glad to have you, uh, Morgan. Um, next is uh, Lindsay Fry. She's the president of an Inc. 5000 company in the sales development services space, uh, Demand Drive. And she's managed hundreds of SDRs in her career. So Lindsay, it's really awesome to have you here. And can you like briefly highlight your story at Demand Drive and maybe share what experiences you're hoping to bring with us today? Yeah, no, thanks. That's great. So um, yeah, I'm Lindsay Fry. I'm one of the co-founders at Demand Drive and we help technology companies build and manage sales development teams. So we're currently managing a team of about 80 to 90 SDRs across um, lots of different uh, clients and, and you know, been, been running teams for sort of the, the better part of 20 years here. Um, what I really hope to bring to the table is just helping uh, give some insight into best practices around managing SDR teams um, in a virtual way and sort of, you know, what's been going on the last few months and how do we move forward. So uh, talking about engagement, motivation, uh, the impact that we've seen on metrics and, and sort of how to approach that as we move forward. Awesome. Cool. I'm really excited to hear about that. Awesome. So to, to kind of like cap us off last but not least, Colin, haven't forgotten about you. Uh, we do have Colin Waldrop here. He's the SDR trainer and a former SDR at SalesLock, which is uh, you know, a leading sales engagement software that's really trailblazing uh, modern sales development for today's sellers. So Colin, could you maybe give us some more context about, you know, what, what your role is as an SDR trainer and what you're really hoping to bring to today's panel with your experiences? Yeah, so I started at sales off about three years ago as an SDR myself, uh, right out of college, uh, went through the gauntlet. I spent about a year and a half in that role. Um, I struggled a lot in the beginning of that role and then figured out how to overcome it. That inspired me, especially after a conversation with Morgan to become an SDR manager for about a year and two months after that. And then just recently I transferred in uh, as an SDR trainer. They opened up that role for me to really focus on some improvements I thought we could drive in the organization. Um, so really excited for these conversations and, and excited for the role as well. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks uh, all of the panelists for being here. Uh, we're gonna jump on in. I'm gonna start by um, kicking off a question over to Lindsay. Um, 
really just wanted to touch on this. There's a lot of discourse around sales development right now. It seems like everyone has something to say in light of what's been happening with COVID. So um, really to kick things off and sort of uh, tee up a question for you, Lindsay, from, from your viewpoint, what do you see dominating the conversation right now? Yeah, no, thanks, AJ. And, you know, it's interesting because obviously we have we have a lot of different clients um, that sell into a lot of different industries. And so I've, I've been getting a lot of questions over the over the last few months here. And um, I think in the beginning, when we first uh, were kind of under stay at home orders, uh, people definitely were very, very nervous, right? Kind of panicked, you know, what is the impact this is going to have? Is this going to have on my business? Specifically, what impact is this going to have on my SDR team? Uh, I think that people sort of walked that back a little bit, uh, some of that panic, and now they're realizing, okay, we're going to have to continue driving revenue. We're going to have to continue growing our business. How is that, what is that going to look like? It still has to happen, but it's happening in a, in, in a bit of a different world. So I think just questions about um, how does, you know, th this pandemic and, and everyone working from home and sort of everyone being in this together to a, gr to a degree impact metrics, things like, you know, should we, should we still be expecting the same uh, level of output from our SDRs? How, do, how is it impacting the rate in which they are able to connect with prospects? Um, I get a lot of questions around how to best engage with your SDR team while remote, um, how to motivate SDR teams while remote, right? I mean, I think that the luxury that that at least demand drive has had is we're all together sort of at the same office. So, you know, motivation, competition, contests, it's, it's easier to do when you're kind of in front of each other. So I, I get a lot of questions around that. Um, I get a lot of questions around, you know, how do we compensate SDR? Should it be, you know, should they still be compensated in the same way if the, if the goals are, um, are adjusted and are changed? And, and then I get a lot of questions because our clients sell into a lot of different industries, you know, which industries are being impacted the most um, and some see, certainly are, right? So, so we talk about that and, and you know, folks want to know what commonalities there are between, you know, some of our clients and, and themselves. So I think those would be the, the, the things that um, I'm be, being asked most about. Awesome. Yeah, I, th I think it really kind of breaks down into two pieces of, you know, on one front, everything's changing internally because right. SDR teams are having to figure out like not only the managers, but the reps themselves, how to right. actually work and do your job at home. It's not as exactly. much accountability, less transparency. And then, like you said, you know, uh, I think this climate is really impacting industries differently. And right. I think to kind of get to your point, AJ, I think it's one of the reasons why everyone has something to say, because it's, it's really a customized situation when you get down to it. But I think there are some some common things that, that are, are good to focus on versus bad to focus on. Yeah. So to, to kind of go over to you, Colin, and give you a similar question, you know, I loved Lindsay's idea that we are really all in this together, both buyers and sellers. And I think everyone is just trying to navigate the, the best they can. And, you know, getting on this topic of how much conversation there is around COVID, I think a lot of it can get unproductive if people are too focused on fear, uncertainty, panic, or maybe just kind of like regurgitating advice just to kind of keep the keep the, the buck rolling. So Colin, what topics have you seen too much of out there right now? And what topics do you wish teams would focus more on um, in today's climate? Yeah, so I think uh, I would be safe to speak on everyone's behalf that um, we're good on articles around work from home. Um, I don't know what it was about everybody had to go work from home and every marketing team and me included when I created cadences and messaging, I was like, Hey, let's like give advice on how to work from home. And everybody's done that. It's just like, I, no matter what, I just hate working from home at this point and no articles going to help me out past what I've already read. Um, so that, I think that's kind of dead if we're still sending that, um, two subjects that I, I do want to hear more about. And one of them we actually address on, on the call today, but it's this idea of, of empathy. Like what does selling with empathy even mean? We actually ran a test over here where we took half the team, half of them, when all of this happened, they just ran with their normal talk tracks. Um, and we compared it to half the team who actually led with um, coronavirus. Like they proactively brought it up. And um, the team that actually led with regular talk tracks outperformed the team who proactively brought up coronavirus. And so um, can you get too cheesy just trying to talk about coronavirus 
Um, so that topic of like how to, what is leading with empathy really mean? But I think one of the subjects that gets roped in with leading with empathy is this idea of how do you personalize? Um, how are you standing out from everybody else and earning time on someone's calendar during this hard time? And that is another topic that I'm really interested in. You know, I would love to get on LinkedIn and just see post after post of sales leaders like, hey, or any, anybody just saying, hey, I gave someone a meeting. Here's what they used to get the meeting. Or SDR saying, hey, here's the email I wrote to get a meeting. Here's the talk track I used. Because that those are the things that get me inspired. Um, I'd love to see more of that. Yeah, that's a really good point. Just the idea. And it really, you know, swings back to the whole, like, we're all in this together idea that um, community is really what's going to drive this forward. And, and the adage that I've been working off of for probably the past couple of months now is the rising tide lifts all boats in the sense that like, it kind of sucks for everyone right now. There's no sugarcoating it for, for a lot of people. So if you can do what you can to help out everyone around you, then in the end, we're all going to get out of this together, hopefully in a better place. So um, the idea that sharing what works versus, hey, this is what doesn't work, don't do this, um, that mentality moving forward is something that um, I would also like to see a lot more people do. And, and I will safely say that I'm also guilty of the working from home article stuff. I, I wrote a couple of those myself, so <laughs> part of the problem. <laughs> Um, Morgan, I'll swing this over to you, someone who uh, sees a lot of content and is really active on LinkedIn and kind of thrives in that space and has created a, a really strong voice for the sales community. You know sort of the power of content and what it can do for sales teams and, and depending on what you put out there, really influence decisions. So uh, on your end, what have you seen leadership teams focus on? What have you seen SDRs focus on? Um, and, and what are your thoughts on that uh, sort of the situation as a whole? In terms of focusing on for their teams to get better during this time or focusing on what they could be posting on LinkedIn? Uh, well, you know, what they're seeing on LinkedIn and, and how that's impacting their decisions for how to get better during this time. Yeah, I think the biggest thing that's a miss is that sometimes we all try to figure out things ourselves as sales reps and not ask the client what they would like to see. So if you're not talking to your clients or you haven't done a round table to understand where, what they're going through. I think that's a, a miss right now across the board. And so the sales teams that I know that are doing well is they're having round tables as part of their webinar content to have the prospects talk about what they are challenged with and what their priorities all are. You also can as well right now, if you're a sales leader, write down what are the main things that your buyers are going through and create messaging off of that as well. So you don't have to have a round table. That's just an idea I'm throwing out there. What I will say as well as what I've seen that people are doing that are successful is that they're willing to understand their ICPs, ICP. So what that means is from an ideal customer profile standpoint, and what an ideal customer profile is, what type of companies are we going after? We all know that that's changed. So what I mean by ICP, ICP is when I'm targeting this company, are their buyers making money? Are they buying their solution? Because if they're not, that's probably a company you shouldn't be reaching out to. Because if they're not making money from their customers, they're not going to buy from you. So you got to change that perspective there. And so if you're reaching out to different clients right now, you have to really dive into the ICPs, the ICP, and understand what you should be doing to grow during this time. And that's talking to your clients and then be willing to do things a lot differently than what people are doing. I will say that based on the data that there's been a 48% increase in activity on LinkedIn in terms of sales development. And that's because more people are on LinkedIn and willing to have the conversation. So also keep that in mind as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. And I, I think that kind of brings up a, another side of, of empathy too, because a lot of people, when they think about empathy, uh, especially in the context of uh, sales development, it's all about the outreach. And it's all about like, wh what can I do like right now that I've made a call or I've sent an email to try to like appear as if I'm genuine or appear as if I care. But I think what you kind of described is, is background empathy. You know, like you can, you can get to the right places and have the right conversations if you deeply understand not only who you're targeting, but what their situation is like. And then try to actually build momentum towards things that are valuable to them. I love that idea of kind of like getting an event together around that, that like buyer audience and having them discuss their problems because that's, they're getting, you know, different points of view and similar industries. And at the same time, like 
whether a deal happens or not, like that rep is getting invaluable knowledge, getting invaluable kind of like clout for their personal brand. And so I, I think you really touched well on that, Morgan. So I, I want to kind of go into, um, you know, the future. I think we've talked a little bit about the, the topics that are dominating the conversation. And Lindsay, I wanted to kind of go into this question of empathy because Morgan kind of cued it up so well. Um, I think a lot of reps kind of get trained and especially now to quote, you know, use empathy in their outreach, which, you know, it is more important than ever in today's times, but you, you have to, to do it well. So in your opinion, like what does empathy mean to, to you, Lindsay, in the current climate and, and how are you seeing reps being trained well to do yeah. it effectively both on sales touches and in the background? No, it's a great question. And I love what Colin said earlier around sort of that A-B test he, he did with his team around sort of the messaging that they always used, almost outperformed or did outperform some of the empathy-led messaging. And here's kind of what I'll say on it. You know, empathy is definitely sort of the buzzword that everyone, you, you, have, to, you have to be empathetic. Like just throw that out and you'll be safe. Um, but I think it's really more around being authentic. If you, if you aren't really empathetic or you can't kind of pull that off, you have to be authentic. So if it's, if it's, if you're better served, just kind of moving forward with your your normal messaging. Um, obviously, being sensitive to the fact that kind of strong arming someone into a meeting is m maybe not going to be not going to work or be a bit off putting. Then I would just say be authentic, right? You you know, um, so that that comes with how you personalize your messaging and and sort of how you like lead with with empathy. Um, I think definitely kind of calling it out is is helpful, especially in the beginning when we were first faced with this quarantine. Um, I myself got prospect, you know, was prospected to, um, prospected at, and and received messages from SDRs, and some of them didn't say anything and just kind of was it was business as usual, um, and some you know kind of called it out and said, hey. I get that we're all kind of in this together. We're all navigating these these waters and th these are interesting times. Um, I did appreciate when someone said, you know, I'm really looking at connecting with you when things settle down or when the time is right and sort of throwing that out there um, that, hey, we have a great solution, uh, but I understand that things are kind of chaotic right now. So it needs to be the right timing for you and your business. Uh, Morgan made a great point about, you know, understanding who, you know, the buyers are and, and sort of being sensitive to that. Um, so that's what I've talked to my team a lot about as far as leading with empathy is really, you know, being authentic, understanding that everyone and, and sort of different industries are being impacted in a different way. There's certainly industries and um, companies that sell technology that help enable remote workers. So they're doing quite well. Um, so maybe, you know, the messaging there is going to be a little different versus, you know, a, um, a client of ours that might be selling into hospital systems, which was a very, very different message. And you certainly needed to lead with empathy when trying to sell software into hospital systems that were, you know, dealing with the, the pandemic firsthand. Um, so I think just recognizing that, calling attention to it, calling it out, with an authentic voice is really helpful. Um, not pushing people into a meeting, um, booking things. I would tell, you know, typically I tell my SDR teams, try to secure a meeting with a qualified prospect within one week as quickly as you can, right? To ha not have enough, not have too much lag time. Um, but then really educating them that, that it's okay if you book something, you know, a month out. Um, you know, just securing something on someone's calendar, you can kind of readdress it at a later date, knowing that kind of the, the world is in a bit of a um, crazy spot. So I hope that answered your question a little bit, but I can dig in a little bit more if you want, but that, that's kind of what I've been um, talking to my team about. Yeah, and I think that you brought up a lot of really good points in terms of like, and this is something I see um, my take on dominating the conversation, but okay. a lot of people are sort of looking for that like silver bullet yeah. In situations like this where it just doesn't really exist. And, and like you said, being authentic and doing the right work is harder and it takes a lot more time, but it's the way that you should be going about it and how you should have done it in the first place. Correct. Um, yes. So like looking for the non-existent silver bullet is I think what a lot of teams are doing when they say, oh, use empathy in your outreach. Oh, Correct. do this, do that. There's no uh, secret sort of word or sentence that I can give you that's going to just magically... Um, <laughs> 
you know, increase your lead rate or your conversion rate. But I think that nice. sort of being authentic and, and doing your research is, is going to, um, it's going to be really, really helpful. Right. So a, a lot of teams in that case, you know, they're looking for this, this solution and Colin, I'll swing this over to you, but um, they're looking for different ways to kind of go about their prospecting process. And maybe if they are looking for that non-existent silver bullet, or if they are playing the long game versus the short game, like switching up the way that they approach prospecting, um, it's pretty apparent across different industries. But um, I'd be curious from your perspective, uh, you know, how the crisis has sort of, sort of shaped the way that you approach prospecting, uh, both now and then if applicable, like how it's going to impact you in the future and how you plan on training reps under sort of this new normal that we're all kind of entering. Yeah. Um, I really can't echo what Morgan had mentioned earlier about the ICP enough. I mean, I think the most important thing you can do as a seller, um, no matter what, is really, really intimately know who you sell to. Like everything about their day in the life, about their frustrations, you know, what makes them mad? Like what are the projects on their plate? Like understand everything. And so hopefully that was done before all this happened. But I think one thing that this epidemic did is it made everybody revisit that conversation. Um, like for us, probably the biggest thing in my role over the past two months has been revisiting that conversation and understanding what's changed about the people we sell to. Um, and so in the past two months, you know, we, one of the people we sell to is a director of sales. So we had our internal director of sales join our SDR scrum and talk about, you know, over the past two months, like what's changed for you? Where is your mindset gone? What are projects on your plate now that weren't on your plate three months ago? What are things that are frustrating you now that weren't frustrating you three months ago? Like what, are, what's changed? Because that's, that is molded how our talk tracks have changed. That, that molds what we lead with in our cold calls, what we lead with in our emails. And so I think readdressing that conversation about everything you need to know about your buyers to understand them is the most important thing you could do um, in all your messaging. I think the second piece of that is, um, I think there's an understanding that this isn't a problem you can just throw more metrics at. Um, that's not to say everybody needs to go low volume, but it's not a problem where you just make more calls and you make up the gap. I think sellers just literally have to be better right now. I think it's, it's tough for almost everybody and you just have to be a better seller. And so I think you have leadership looking at things at metrics that have always been there, but they haven't really, really looked into it, like positive conversation rates. Like if someone says hello on the phone, who's the best at that outcome of that call being positive, like interested, or you scheduled a disco, or you scheduled a demo, and really studying those talk tracks about what's working right now with that rep. You know, they're studying like efficiency scores. Um, so for your reps, how many activities is it taking to source a qualified meeting? You know, you've got rep A who it takes X amount of activities. You've got rep B where it takes nine times the amount of activities. That means rep B has to work nine times harder. And so I think a lot of leadership right now is studying that gap and really diving into coaching their reps to be better and focusing on that skill. And I think that's something that's going to last way longer than this pandemic is realizing some things that work really well in sales that they've never really looked into. And we know this is happening because in the past month and a half um, with our customer base, there's been 30% more cadences created than ever before. And so that tells us that people are trying new things. They're studying their sales motion. They're creating new cadences to try new things out. Um, and I think that's, that's good to see in the sales community of just getting creative and trying new things out. Real yeah, quick, I, I totally agree. Oh. Before oh, you jump ahead. in, Grayson, I just wanted to ask it kind of a follow up there, Colin. You, you mentioned the idea of sort of like the longevity of the, the process that, that's going on with sales leaders right now in terms of digging deeper into the metrics and sort of trying to understand them on a more granular level and, and how it impacts teams and, and that it's going to stay for longer than this pandemic will. Um, I'm curious if you think similarly to the point you brought up before that in terms of like talking with individuals within your own organization that fit your ICP and really understanding what they want, what their frustrations are on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you think that it's going to take like another situation like this, like another sort of crisis pin to go back to that? Or is this going to stay? Are we going to keep interviewing people internally and get that feedback from them? Because I know a lot of companies don't, they don't do that right now. Yeah. I think anytime you see this big of a change, like not even at a economic scale, even maybe a business, like in a business case, but like when something changes, you need to revisit the conversation about what's changed for your prospects. Uh, if the market changes, what's changed for your prospects? Uh, because if you keep the talk tracks you were using two years ago and so much has changed between now and two years and you've got just old talk tracks. And so I think it's always staying up to date on 
um, you know, the frustrations that your potential customers are having, what a day in the life is. As technologies evolve, some of the frustrations are lessened. So you need to know that's happening out there. And so I think that's always evolving. And I honestly think it's a hack for any sales leadership, getting your customers to come in and talk to your SDRs about their day in the life. Like you can teach them all day long. Like come from like a sales trainer, you can teach them all day long um, the exact words. But when a customer says, oh, here's why I bought your software, the reps are just like, that's why? Like, it's like a hack to the system to just have customers come talk to your SDRs and say, hey, here's, here are my frustrations. Here's exactly why I bought your software. Um, and I think you'll see, if, it's like if you did that every single month, I think you would have customers come in and their answer, their frustration, why they bought kind of develops over time. And you need to know that as an organization. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I think what you kind of propose there is this idea that, you know, when, when business environments change, uh, it kind of forces the companies to be aware and be agile. And especially if you're in sales, I mean, you nailed on the head earlier, but you should have intimate knowledge of the market you're selling into. And what that implicitly means is you have to keep up with them and actually stay up to date on how they're changing because you can set a strategy, you can have a, a, like a cadence that worked well in the past, but if that's what you stick with and you don't really try to do constant testing, interviews, trying to get that feedback, then you're, you're not only gonna lose performance over time, you're gonna be lost and kind of blind to, you know, what did change, what is happening? And I, I think, you know, the, the reps are kind of expected to you know, learn to be empathetic, kind of learn to do consultative selling, learn how to you know, in, in real time, understand these new changes that are happening and try to deal with them. But I, I wanted to kind of transition to, to you, Morgan, and talk about the, the leadership side. You know, what advice would you be giving to managers right now to help prepare not only themselves and, and their team, but the individual reps to, to thrive in this new environment? Because what we seem to all agree on is, things are changing and you know, some industries are changing faster than others. And so as a you know, general rule or some advice, you know, what would you say Morgan to the managers out there trying to get their team together, trying to build that awareness and trying to get themselves in the right direction? So first and foremost, it comes to messaging. So Lindy had touched on this, which is, Hey, everyone's saying, Hey, we got to be empathetic now. So, okay, cool. Yeah, we get it. However, it's, what does that, what does that mean? So you want to change that to tactical, empathy, not fake empathy. And so what tactical empathy is at the end of the day is going back to what Colin was saying, which is having conversations on why are people buying your product? Why are people buying your service? And having more SDRs understand that and hear that so they're able to then create the messaging that they care about when it comes to prospecting. As, as leaders, that has to be on the forefront. And so when you have those messages that I get and they're like, yeah, hope you're safe and you're healthy, that's not going to be very helpful in terms of prospecting because that's more fluff and you need to get straight to the point. If you know that person, then have at it. However, if it's a cold prospecting email, that's not leading to higher opens and it's not going to lead to higher response rates. And that's just what I've seen across the board and talking to a lot of reps and a lot of executives on the prospecting end. To dive in deeper into that from a leadership perspective, if you're a frontline manager, it's time to be a proactive coach. There's a difference between being a manager and a coach. A lot of people can manage, not a lot of people can coach. And so the main focus now is what can you be doing to help your team moving forward? Are you doing weekly coaching sessions on certain topics that your team cares about? Are you doing mock cold calling sessions? Are you, we just said a 30% increase in cadences. Are you creating new cadences and AB testing them and piling them with new reps in the organization? If you're not doing these things, that's where you're going to be falling behind. And it's not just about being a sales development leader. It's being a sales leader. As we move forward in this new environment, reps are going to be asked to close and also prospect at the same time. There's not going to be a place where AEs can just sit there and chill. And so if you're prepping that SCR to move into that AE role, you should also be teaching them how to qualify appropriately how to close appropriately, not closing the deal, but closing for next steps. These are things that we need to be focused on as a sales development community is building sales reps, not just focusing on the prospecting skills itself. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that really ties into a lot of the, the discussion around enabling SDRs more now. And, and like, 
the idea that, you know, you don't have an SDR to just sit there and make 150 dials for you and try and book a handful of meetings for your AE, sort of like that mindless go out and get me, get me meetings, but more of a strategic partner to the AE team, to the, the management team, to the coach, and really like investing in the SDR role so that like I kind of touched on earlier, the rising tide lifts all boats works internally at a company too. Like if you bring up the bottom level of your organization on the sales side of things to new heights, like the whole organization is going to get better from it. So is it sad that like we're talking about this now because the, of a crisis and that it sort of was like the spark or the catalyst to, to have conversations within teams internally? A little, but like stuff that you should have been doing the whole time, I think is what you really were touching on. Like we should be coaching. We should be managing better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, awesome. So uh, we did get a handful of questions um, from the audience as well. Thank you to everyone who did submit something prior to registration. And there were a handful of topics in there that we really wanted to touch on um, during this discussion. And, and I'll throw the first one over to Lindsay because it's kind of directly related to your role here at Demand Drive. But um, in terms of centrally located SDR teams and the idea that we might all go back into the office one day. Um, a lot of organizations are kind of punting on that idea and moving towards more of a structured work from home style okay. scenario or restructuring their work from home policy altogether. Sure. Um, so a lot of reps, you know, have started remote. That they're looking for advice in terms of how to effectively ramp up in the role at home. Um, and a lot of managers are looking for advice in terms of like, do I let everyone back in the office when I can. What, what do I do from here on out? So we'd love to hear some thoughts from you on that. Sure. Yeah, I think again, in the begin, the first few weeks of this, you know, it was a lot different than sort of how things have, have shaken out, right? I think um, I, for one, do not like working from home. I'm just gonna go and say that right now. Um, I prefer being, you know, in the office, you know, being around sort of everybody and, and kind of um, feeding off that energy. I enjoy that, but we're not in a situation where that's doable right now. What I, what I think kind of happened is we are fortunate to live um, in the time that we do where we have technology and solutions that can um, enable us to work from home and work remotely um, really efficiently and effectively. So that helps. Uh, I think that once everybody got acclimated to sort of their day-to-day, -day, <laughs> the day-to-day -day structure and life working from home um, and utilizing those tools, I think, at least from our standpoint, and I've heard this from a lot of clients, things, you know, kind of, they, they, things figured themselves out, right? People were able to be productive and people were able to hit goal and, and work effectively and work efficiently. Um, so now we're faced with, um, you know, at least in Massachusetts, where things are lifting a little bit and people are going out a little bit more, you know, what do we as a private business do? You know, what's the right thing to do for our people and what's the right thing to do for, for our, our business and our company? You know, I think, you know, as sales leaders, we're, we're you know, kind of thinking about that. And then the, the reps and our team members are also, you know, they have varying degrees of comfort, right, in, in sort of whether they're ready to go back or not. So, I think that um, what it's going to look like, uh, you know, I think, is there, a, is there a time in the future where we're all back? I do believe that's going to be the case. Um, is it going to take some time? Probably. I think that what we'll most likely see, and AJ, I was talking to you a little bit about this earlier, is perhaps small groups coming to the office. One thing that I've talked to my team about is you know, if um, one of our client success managers wants to bring in a few reps and obviously social distance and stay six feet apart and wear masks in public spaces, I want to throw that out there, um, that, that that would be okay, right? That there might be some benefit to kind of hearing other people on the phone around you, you know, if um, somebody's struggling, maybe bringing them in um, for, for some FaceTime. But I think that we've at least from our standpoint, and again, what I've seen a lot of clients do is think, okay, well, we've kind of figured this work from home thing out. Like we've kind of figured out that for the most part, there's always outliers, but for the most part, people are able to work effectively. So we'd rather be sort of conservative about our re-entry plan 
um, then kind of force everybody to come back and then um, and, and maybe not be comfortable with that if they are able to be productive and maybe kind of keep it at those small groups and, and in kind of a safe way. Um, I think there's some, what I've seen is that there's some SDRs that, that love working from home. They're actually more productive. They're able to get more done. There's less distractions. And I think then there's SDRs that, um, much like myself, do feed off the energy of others and miss that camaraderie, miss sort of the ability to kind of be in the office. And, and Colin, I laughed when you said that because you, you mentioned that. And, you know, I, um, I was talking to some folks and it seems, this is just kind of an aside, but um, once we got to week seven, I think a lot of people hit a wall. Like, okay, we're figuring things out. Like, this is okay. And then week seven happened and everyone's like, okay, when are we going to be able to kind of see everybody else? Um, but I think that can, that can happen. We just want to do it the right way. Uh, as far as new SDRs who, you know, we've hired actually quite a few SDRs during the pandemic. So I haven't even been able to meet them in person. It's all been virtual. So that poses some challenges for those folks, right? That they have to join a team in a virtual capacity and, and, um, and have training all done, you know, via Zoom. Uh, so I think my re recommendation and suggestion to those folks, to new SDRs, is to really reach out, utilize tools like Slack and, um, and tools like LinkedIn to connect with your client and with your peers and your colleagues. Um, you know, I think we've been at Demand Drive trying to do I, I'm doing a bi-weekly all hands meeting just to make sure everybody knows what's going on, you know, with the company, what's going on with our clients, um, shout outs for, for things that, that are going well, um, certain SDRs, certain teams. So I think just taking part in those, in those types of meetings. Um, I know there's a lot of virtual happy hours. Everyone's talking about those. I think especially new people join them, like reach out, um, you know, I was uh, talking to one of my SDRs earlier and, and AJ, actually, she was saying that she didn't really know you very well before we all left for the pandemic. But now she, you guys have been doing the virtual yoga class on Tuesdays with Kevin. So now she- It's a workout. It's not yoga. Let's, <laughs> <come on. laughs> oh, AJ, come on. Um, so, but that, that's really, like, she's actually gotten to know you a lot more just in that way. So I would suggest and recommend, you know, especially new reps to take part in those things if, you're, if your company is, um, is hosting, uh, you know, like virtual events like that, I think is really helpful and certainly use all the tools that we have at our disposal to, um, to connect and stay engaged. You know, making sure that leadership uh, works really closely with training teams or senior SDRs on how to best engage um, their SDR teams, you know, when they are training new hires or training on a new pro project or product, um, you know, that has to be tweaked a little bit. I think it's, it's hard to stare at a computer screen all day, uh, especially when you're training. So making sure you're taking breaks and things like that. But um, I kind of rambled on AJ, was there anything else you wanted me to touch on there? No, I think that was great. Okay. You know, real, real good high level overview of like, you know, this is the reality of the situation. I don't unfortunately have a crystal ball. I don't yeah. know when we'll all be. I'm sorry, Colin. I wish I could tell you like when you'll be back and uh, back in your office <laughs> with, with um, all your colleagues and friends. But, uh, you know, I think I think it is smart for companies to kind of be conservative and, and realize that we are fortunate to live in a world where technology has allowed us to, to do this pretty well. Um, and, and then, you know, hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll, we'll be back together. Yeah, I, I think you touched on it perfectly. Cause I mean, I've, I've been doing remote work for quite a while, like more than five years. And so I've, I've always lived in this world. And, you know, as this transition has happened, I think you touched on the two pieces that I would bring up perfectly, which is like, you need accountability, yeah. you need communication yeah. because nothing changes it's just how you go about right. interacting with the people on your team, how you go around about like measuring and tracking performance. Right. And then I think the biggest thing that, that, that a lot of people struggle with is the accountability piece because managers can help you to a certain extent. I think peers can help you to a certain extent, but it's a different way to work where you have to learn how to be proactive and accountable, even at home. Like you might be working, but that home environment, it's very easy to get distracted and That's kind true. of get you pulled out of that. So I think that was a great answer, Lindsay. Um, okay, Colin, so I've got a question for you because messaging and how you engage with buyers, I think was a very, 
kind of popular question that a lot of the registrants reached out about. And in our first video series at SD Revolution, you brought up uh, what was called the social cadence. I think it was from uh, Inside Out that had kind of brought that about where, you know, we talked really about this idea of having uh, multiple channels going on within your cadence and, and really reaching buyers where they like to be reached. So to kind of cue off this question, in light of everything that's gone on in this new climate with, you know, people interacting in different ways to, to you know, the general messaging that you receive, um, have you found any like certain types of messaging or new cadences that is kind of being better received than, you know, what used to be in the past or maybe what you were currently doing at Sales Loft before it all happened? Yeah, I think as far as um, cadences, so like I, we'll look at like touches, like there are always in any organization, you're going to have people no matter what, they're going to prefer the phone and they are killer on the phone and they don't even want to touch email. They're all flirted emails. They're just give me templates. Just let me make phone calls. Then you have people on the opposite side of that who are really creative. They can write really good emails or do really good on LinkedIn. And I don't think this changes that at all. You're still going to have those people. Um, what you may find is the people who are really, really good on the phone, maybe they're not setting that one or two last meetings to get to their number and they need to strengthen the other channels. Mm -hmm. And so I think for that middle piece, what we found is it's more important than ever to kind of build credibility in a brand with a prospect on the front end of reaching out to them. So for us, we put a lot of thought into the first email we send somebody, um, a lot of research into it. Um, we've spent a lot of time with reps really researching the process of finding research so they don't feel like they're spinning their wheels and we're just saying, hey, go personalize and throwing them to the wolves and they have to figure out how to personalize. So I think that's a really important piece of teaching everybody, if you're gonna write a really good email, what does that look like for them? And that's the first step for us, like building kind of a brand with that prospect and a good, like um, building credibility. And then, yeah, I think it's the LinkedIn. I think it's everything so that before you ever pick up that phone, um, you've already built some credibility ahead of time. So you say, Hey, this is calling over at sales off. And they say, Colin, yeah, I got, got the email. And, um, and I think that's even more important nowadays is to build that brand on the front end of, of your cadence or of your process, um, whatever those steps are. Um, and then find the reps that are really good at phone. That's always hit their number through phone and, uh, and then work with them to help them on email now. Um, and then vice versa. And so, um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. A lot of an enablement talk, you know, finding and, and bringing out the most in your SDRs really and, and giving them the tools that they need to succeed versus like you said, kind of tossing them to the wolves and letting them get eaten up by prospects on the other end. One, um, one thing I will mention on that topic, something that's been consistent to us, we started using um, something called Alice probably um, six, seven months ago. And it's a, uh, it's a gift sending service. And the cool thing about it, especially in the current climate is um, you don't pay for the gift until they accept it via email. And so you let them know over email that you're sending them a gift. They just have to accept it and then you pay for it. So as a company, it's not really expensive to send gifts. And um, we had really, really good um, results with that before this, but even through all this in the past month and a half, we've averaged probably a 36% meeting book rate if they open the email with a gift. And so I think that's something like a really unique um, touch that not a lot of people use that we started using about six months ago and it is holding steady through all this. Um, people really appreciate that extra touch of doing the research on them, seeing that they like something and then you sending them a gift about what they like and saying, I'd love to trade this for a conversation. Um, that seems to be working really, really well for us right now. That's awesome. Yeah. And yeah. it, it kind of hinges, you know, on the idea that you've done the research and you personalized the gift to them versus like, here's a $15 Starbucks gift card. Can you please take a meeting? There's a very different yeah. connotation uh, with that message versus like, oh, I know you're a big Arsenal fan. Um, yeah. Thought it would be fun if I got you this like soccer ball that was our Arsenal logo. That, that has a bit of a different flair to it. Yeah, we had one of our reps, um, it, a bit creepy, but for the gifts, we do a little bit more research. And he went on Facebook and saw that his prospect was, he, he had a dog that he absolutely loved. His, I think his dog thing was Toby or something and absolutely loved his dog. And he had been working with his prospect for a while. The prospect had actually set up a meeting ghosted and has just not responded in like a month. And so he sent the gift and he, it was a three month subscription to a bark box. And the subject line was Toby, will, will you ask your dad to give me a meeting? 
And then in the email, he's like, Hey, I know we've been going back and forth for a while right now. Like things are absolutely crazy. And I get that. Um, and I get that it's time consuming to hop on a meeting, maybe feeding your dog. Now it won't be so time consuming because I bought you a subscription to BarkBox. And, uh, and then it's just like literally click here to accept your BarkBox subscription. And, uh, and then he booked a meeting right there. And so, um, that's some of the creative ways. One of the better ones I've seen, uh, that's just really quick and easy. Awesome. Yeah. I like the idea of, you know, giving reps and enabling reps to think outside the box, be creative, do that kind of research and really focus on kind of taking the SDR role to a, another level and, and being more than just somebody who books meetings, but someone who strategizes and works towards booking the right meeting, getting in touch with the right person, understanding like why you're reaching out, that whole thing. Um, and Morgan, you kind of touched on this on this earlier, and it's a question that we had uh, introduced uh, from the from the audience before we started. But the idea that SDRs are going to start ending ending up being more like junior account executives at some point, and, and really transcend beyond that appointment setter level, and be more strategic partners to their AEs and, and through their support. So, would would love to hear your thoughts on that, and then sort of some advice for anyone. Um, in the SDR role to improve collaboration with their AE team and how to sort of get to that level uh, from where they are now. Yeah, so like how I, how I see it is that there are going to be a lot more people that are going to move into, instead of going from SDR to normally just an AE where the SDR is supporting, to, supporting you, it's going to go S, SDR to more, what a lot of people are calling them as corporate sales executives. And what that means is that you are being asked to do your own prospecting and close SMB type deals so that you can still have the motion of prospecting while closing. So then when you go to mid-market and enterprise, you still have that skill tight within your entire modern sales prospecting. Because there's a lot of people who, who have selling experience and have been in the role for a while. However, in working with clients, they aren't prospecting as much because they have the SDRs handing that off, which is a huge disconnect in most organizations because they ask their ease to prospect and they normally aren't. And so what can an SDR be doing right now? If you're an SDR and you're sourcing deals to your AE, go from the first call and stay on all the calls until close one. Now, not every deal is going to close, right? But if you're an SDR and you're looking to skill up, then find an AE you want to work with and listen to those calls. Ask them to BCC you on those threads. That's what I did with my enterprise AE. I was BCC'd on big deals and just, to, just so he could show me like, hey, this is work that goes into this. You don't just hand it off and the deals close. Like there's a lot that goes on. And so I think sometimes as a SDR, you're just saying, hey, I set up the meeting. You should just close this when there's more things that happen, right? And in return, the AE should respect the SDR for setting up those meetings because it's a hard job to do. And so making sure that you're having an AE mentor. So if you're an SDR right now or an SDR manager on this call, you should encourage your SDR to get an SDR or AE mentor so they can have someone they're meeting with weekly to go over, okay, this is how I run my discovery call. This is why I do things this way. This is how I organize my day. And these are things that are extremely important that are missed sometimes across most organizations. So if you're looking to skill yourself up as an SDR, take the time to listen to those calls. Take the time to ask for feedback from other AEs on how you can get better and find an AE mentor that you can cling on to so you can get those results as well. Awesome. That's yeah, really good advice and, and good on the collaboration side of things. Like you're all in the same team. And when you really think about it, like there's no reason to silo the two uh, teams from one another. There, there shouldn't be a fence in between the two of them. Uh, I hear a lot teams are like, Oh, like if you're an SDR, your job is to you know, toss meetings over the fence metaphorically you don't see what's on the other side of the fence like you just know that i take a meeting i toss it over and every once in a while it pops out as a closed deal um yeah. whereas it, it should be a, a totally transparent situation like i gave you this why do you like this deal why do you not like this deal what could i have done better to qualify it for you what do, you, what do i have too much of like that's all super important and stuff that yeah i think a lot of teams should should kind of focus on right now absolutely especially now yeah <laughs> I know Grayson was about to ask a question, but it looks like he froze. He froze. So, yeah, I will. He got too excited. So He's just, just very still. Yeah. No, he a smile on his face. So it's good. Yeah. Be it's, yeah, it's way better to be frozen in that situation. Yeah. <laughs> he could have made. I'll, I'll take it for him. He's happily. There he is. 
He's oh, back. Jason, you're back. You you froze for a second. So oh, I think AJ, you maybe should take it anyway. He came oh, back as a robot. You uh you are robotic, unfortunately. That's just the uh, you know, internet doesn't want to cooperate all the time, which I totally understand. Um, so the question that he was going to ask, at least I assume he was going to ask, and I'll, I'll open it up discussion-wise to the three of you on the panel. Um, a lot of uh, topics brought up were around um, giving and, and sort of on, on the front end as an SDR, uh, giving more than you take. When, when you speak with a, a prospect, you're supposed to know a whole lot about them. You're supposed to really understand their frustrations, their, their needs, what their day-to-day -day looks like. We've talked about this, um, but the idea that in order to, to get something from them, a meeting, uh, some kind of information about their, their situation, uh, it often requires a give. So uh, opening it up to all of you, what do you consider to be a good give and, and strategy around what you can give as an SDR to a prospect to get the meeting, for lack of a better phrase? And I don't know, Lindsay, you look like you're- uh, I, can, I can jump in quickly. Um, so a couple, a couple, thoughts, right? I, I, I think you're absolutely right. You want to know quite a bit about your prospect and you, you don't want to just be every time you're emailing them asking for a meeting or, hey, do you have an update on, on next steps? That, that's, you know, that definitely can be off-putting. So, you know, what I educate my SDRs to do, it can be anything from a piece of content that you think would be interesting to them based on maybe you know, what they're sharing on social media or what they, what, you know, their um, job description entails, right? So a piece of content that you think they would be genuinely interested in. Um, it could be, you know, advice that you had, right? On, on maybe a challenge that they talked to you about a couple months ago and, and maybe you found a technology or solution or a workaround that could maybe help them. And, and you, you know, that shows that you were listening and paying attention and, and you can offer just some advice. Um, my main thing is though, just give that and don't then ask for something in return, right? Like it's just kind of, hey, here, I thought you, you know, based on our last conversation, I thought you'd be interesting and in, interested in this piece of content. It really talked about X, Y, and Z. Um, or I had an idea about that problem that you talked about. And then just leave it at that, right? If, if they're interested, they're going to then respond to you and say, hey, you know what, we should reconnect. You don't need, I, in my opinion, I don't think you need to kind of call that out. Just offer whatever it is that you're offering. Um, I mean, I like this, this Alice service. I mean, I, I had a company send me a nice bottle of wine. That was, that was they didn't get the meeting, but I, I definitely appreciated it. Um, but I think just give and then kind of let it go. And if they're interested, they will, I, I think reconnect with you is my two cents on it. Yeah. Something I think I'll add to that is I don't know um, cause we just went through the stage of trying to put together like kind of a give cadence where we can have a piece of content that we just give to our prospects. And I think yeah. what we quickly realized is there's not one piece of content that just resonates with all your prospects right. unless you have a very defined prospect. And I think giving is like, you give to a very specific scenario. And so like, um, like an example of that is we just got a new CRO and the CRO had mentioned in one of his meetings that every time he joins a new company, he reads this book. And like, for me, it was just like, anytime, if I'm prospecting a new CRO and they've been at their job in less than a month, that's a perfect give. It's just like, Hey, most CROs, when they join an organization, this is the book they read. Wanted to go ahead and give you this book. That's a great give. Or if you know something very specific or you can have a give for that person and it's actually helpful to their use case, those are the powerful things. I don't know if you can ever put together like a cadence or, or a template where it's just one blanket give and it helps everybody unless you create it specifically for a specific use case. Um, but I would be aware of that. Yeah. So what I would do is I would go to marketing and I would ask them what's the most downloadable content that they've, that they have and what's also the most watched webinar that they've had. And then that was, that's what, what I would give. Cause obviously the, the market, has said that those are things that they really like and then add those as piece of your, of your outreach strategy. And then on top of that as well, Lindsay already said it, is don't ask for time on those. It's just like, hey, our right. clients are saying That's that this, this article is something that they found to be great. Here are the three bullet points of what it covers. Hope you find it insightful. So by you having that as a give, it doesn't, you don't come off as a person that's trying to take something in, in return. You're just saying, hey, this is just something for you to check out. And more people will reply to you, more people will engage with you because of that. So 
it's understanding what you need to give, right? From Colin's perspective and not just saying, hey, here's some things you just want to give to you to give to you. Don't just send a book and you've never read it before and you don't know it's going to be applicable. Like really understand like what you are giving to that person and making sure it's relevant to them. So that, that's my take off on it. Yep. Oh, I love it. I wish I got more books in the mail, to be honest. I, I, I've been trying to read more <laughs> while we're all stuck. I know, seriously. Careful what you ask for. <laughs> I know, yeah. All of a sudden I'm going to get Amazon packages. <laughs> Careful. Um, <laughs> no, that was, that's awesome. And, and um, just to kind of wrap all of this up, I think, you know, we got a lot of really good advice from, from the three panelists here in terms of not just what we've seen, but like what we're kind of expecting for the future. And really when you think about sales development moving forward, we, we all touched on it, but like not a whole lot has changed in terms of how we're doing things. It's just understanding situations and responding in real time, human to human and, and, and really understanding your prospects and moving forward from there. So there are no silver bullets. We're not saying that there are silver bullets, but hopefully what um, we talked about today on this panel can you know, push people in the right direction and, and understand how to go about this moving forward as we enter a new normal that none of us really know what's gonna happen in. So it's unknown for us all, but I think at the, at the end of the day, we kind of know what we're doing anyway. So if anyone has any last quips, thoughts, whatever's, anything at all, by all means, this is the time to say it, but. I thought I learned a lot today and I put this together. So that says something. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, AJ. Thank you, Grayson. Yeah, I'll say the same thank thing. Thank you guys so much. Guys. Same thing as thanks so much, AJ Grayson, for putting this together. And for everybody that was listening, don't just take notes and get excited and move on. Like do the stuff that everyone said here. I'd say that on every single thing that I'm on, like it's, you know, you can get excited about it, but that doesn't mean nothing if you don't execute it. So definitely take what we're saying here and try some of the stuff out, implement it in your teams and see what results you get. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Cool. Cool guys. So um, thank you guys so much for joining us for uh, the state of sales development in 2020. Um, like AJ mentioned, we will have uh, a recording of this event uh, if you had to hop off or if you just want to share it with your team members. Uh, and in the meantime, you know, make sure to go to uh, SDREV on social. You can find us on LinkedIn and Facebook and follow us. Uh, we'll be posting updates in the future for content and events like this. And uh, feel free to also join our community. You can uh, give us your email and we'll make sure to keep you up to date on everything going on. Uh, most recently as our podcast is coming out next. So um, Colin, Morgan, Lindsay, uh, again, thank you guys so much for joining and dropping some, some knowledge bombs on everybody today. Tuesday is about day. <laughs> right. Thank you guys for putting it together. Yeah. See Thanks, you guys. guys. Take care. Okay. All right. Thanks,